Hey family, thank you for tuning in to Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please hit that subscribe button. What's up, Phil? Hey, what is going on? How are you, man? Fabulous, my brother. Another wonderful day. Um, coming out coming out with some new information. Um, also want to remind everybody about our membership program. That's right? right, guys. So if you see the little button directly under this video, it says join, which means you get to be a part of our Our Roots community. You know, we have uh, a lot of things going on right now, um, whether it's extra videos or uh, other extra content, discounts or merch. You know, uh, we have some other things coming away too. Check the comments of this video for those uh, those details on how to, uh, you know, we'll talk about it in another video, but you know what I mean, Joe? Absolutely, and uh, all the perks that come with the lives as well, being able to uh, interact personally with us, to be able to make your questions a priority. You know, we sincerely appreciate our members, just like we appreciate everyone. So what are we talking about today? Today's video is IFA protocol. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, Phil. A lot of people would probably look at me and think, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, kind of prancing through ceremony, knowing exactly what to do. And I'd be lying if I said that's not the case right now. But um, in the very beginning, it was actually very scary. I mean, when you go to one of these functions or you're interacting with initiated people, the one thing people don't want to do is anything wrong. Right. So, you know, we wanted to come out with this video to kind of help people understand how the interactions and the nuances that come with it go. So basically, this is a video to teach us how to act um, when we're in a, you know, IFA setting. So it's like a etiquette kind of. There you go. IFA etiquette almost. Absolutely. But believe it or not, IFA is almost a little bit more militant. Um, there is a little bit more of a structure, you know, that, you know, ideally you don't want to violate because you have open minded people like us who understand, hey, you know, mistakes happen, you know, people are learning, etc. But then you have other people who may come from another generation or a time where it was much more rigid. Um, and, you know, African culture in general is really based on respect and protocol. So we want to start from the most basic of interactions. And the big question we get a lot of times is, Baba, you know, I'm involved or I'm getting involved and I see another initiated person. What do I do? How do I address them based on rank and things like that? So I'll be frank with you. The majority of the time when I'm not in this setting, you probably wouldn't know I was a Bawalao, right? Other than, I guess, my behavior. You know, I try to conduct myself like a gentleman 24 hours out of the day. Um, but other than that, I really don't wear a lot of necklaces, bracelets. I'm not wearing an Al Root shirt um, all the time. Um, so I actually don't say much to people or people don't say much to me unless, you know, we actually get recognized by the channel sometimes. Um, and simply because, you know, some people might not know how to, you know, carry on either. You know, you have some people that might have 10 necklaces on, a bracelet on, and they might not know how to respond um, to somebody saying something to them, or they might not have anything done at all because we kind of live in a time where you can go into any botanica and some professionals will consecrate anything for anyone without due process. So usually I actually don't say anything. Um, but if I was, um, you know, this is the advice I would give. I mean, if you can recognize that somebody is an Olorisha, right, or has, a, you know, Ileke Orisha on or necklaces of Orisha on, um, you might be able to get away with saying like, hey, Ashe, or something brief, um, either you're going to be, you know, fully reciprocated or somebody's going to look at you like you have horns coming out of your head because, you know, as far as pedigree and process, you know, the grooming um, aspects have, you know, not been focused on like before. Or someone might not even know what they have on per se, you know, or somebody might just have a piece of jewelry that looks like Ifan Orisha with no idea of what connotations come with it. Are there like a lot of phonies, though? Absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and I would say our community is at blame to that, at blame for that as well, because, and this is why we're such a uh, opponent of, um, you know, the necklace ceremony per se, because it really doesn't provide, you know, identity as far as, you know, being able to commune with the Orisha like that. Just putting on some necklaces without having the Orisha or taking the Orisha through the process that it needs to, um, to be able to function for you doesn't really create that bond. So that's why we really don't delve into it. And the first necklace you receive in our spiritual home is Orula's via your hand of Ifa process, right? 
Um, so that's where, you know, I, I mean, it's not as gangsta as like, you know, you're wearing a certain color, or a certain bead and, you know, are you part of said organization where there's, you know, even more intense like repercussions, but um, you really don't know how people are going to react. Some people might not really care. Um, some people might be indifferent or some people, you know, might take it as offensive. So you always want to be very careful um, who you choose to express yourself spiritually with. I mean, even though we're all under a similar flag, it doesn't mean we all carry ourselves the same way. So with the people I initiate, I always uh, best advise them, you know, interact with the people from the house in the beginning. Um, and then at that point, once you get your bearings and get a couple things under your belt, then at that point, you really don't have to worry about it because you know exactly who you are. You know your heritage and due process, right? So that would be the first thing. But let's say you run into a, a Babalawo, right? You know, when you receive the hand of Ifa process, they kind of go over this briefly, you know, as far as the salutations and whatnot. Um, it doesn't need to be uber or formal, like Olu Iboru, Olu Iboya, like the full thing. Um, but, you know, just an Iboru Boya or Iboru, something like that is more than enough. Um, but I always recommend that it be directed towards people that are deserving of that recognition because, for example, Let's say you have a brother, um, you know, he has his regalia on or a biggie day on and he's not carrying himself accordingly. I wouldn't, you know, bother, you know, really saluting him or saying hello um, if I didn't absolutely need to because, you know, he's really not carrying himself the way Orumila would. So why would I salute him the way Orumila was, right? A lot of this has to do with behavior. We have to make sure that the people we're giving this prestige to of a salutation, which is prestigious anytime you say hello to somebody randomly, that they're deserving of it based on their behavior. If not, it's better to kind of go about your way because even though we're all present, we're not all the same, right? So um, those are your options in a most streamlined, normal fashion without making anybody feel too awkward, right? Um, so... Speaking of Babalawos and speaking of, you know, Olorisha, the dynamic changes um, a little more intensely when it comes to our elders, right? So, for example, if um, you run into your godfather of Ifa, you know, it's pretty obligatory. Um, you might see Babalawos kneel in front of each other. Like, for example, if I'm in front of my elders, I'll take a knee. That's how Babalawos salute their elders. Um, it's one of the various ways. Um, you know, apart from touching the floor, which is pretty standard, or, you know, a babalawo can throw himself to another babalawo with, without any issues whatsoever. Um, but you definitely want to do something, you know, when you see your, your Ifa elder. Um, the same thing with your Orisha elder. And in this video, we're also going to go over, you know, the protocol, like as far as being a Iawo, because I know a lot of, uh, you know, recently initiated brothers and sisters watch the program as far as, you know, what is protocol. So me as a Babalawo, when I, you know, interact with my elders or whatnot, I, I take a knee usually. I mean, if it's super formal, I might throw myself fully. Um, with Babalawos, though, there is a little bit of a debate as to whether we should fully prostrate ourselves in front of our Orisha elders. Um, I can't knock a brother for doing that. Um, it's not a means of ego whatsoever. But, um, you know, there are Odus that actually say that this isn't ideal where the Orishas would actually become uncomfortable, where Orumila or his sons would throw themselves um, in front of them simply because they viewed Orumila as elder, right? Where all of the Orishas, let's say you're at a drumming, no matter what, especially if the Babalabu is carrying himself accordingly, the Orishas search for the Oluos and they throw themselves. Um, you know, like for example, we had a drumming for Oshun the other day. Oshun tried to throw herself to me and I, I caught her. I don't let her hit the ground. Um, you know, I appreciate the courtesy, but you know, it's not something I'm a fan of either, but it's process. You know, we have to become more comfortable with it and understand that, you know, it's just protocol. Um, but you know, there are brothers who throw themselves in front of their godmothers or godfathers, and I can't knock them for that. Um, at the end of the day, it's all about being around people who understand what's going on. And, you know, we're all family and things like that. I, I can't knock it whatsoever. But worst case scenario, if they wanted to, Anil, you know, definitely don't let any of your elders in any context throw themselves to you. For example, my mother doesn't throw herself to me. The gentleman that, uh, you know, gave me uh, Orisha Olohun, um, you know, I don't let him throw himself to me. My godmother, God forbid, you know, um, any of those things. So, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend ever letting an elder throw themselves to you, regardless of the position you have. But, um, you know, it really comes down to comfortability level of those there, you know. So that's the Babalawo aspect of things. Now, from an Olorisha standpoint, um, it isn't as, you know, um, cautious. I mean, if someone has initiated you into, you know, Orisha, whether it be your, uh, 
you know, Olorisha, right, or your Oyubona, godparent or second godparent, you pretty much hit the deck every time you see them, right? You know, I guess other than some occasions, but where this becomes much more intense is definitely during the uh, Iyawurahe, right? Um, so that's basically protocol. And then for all the Yawos, um, you know, whenever you come into uh, an elder that obviously has more than one year of Odisha, you hit the deck no matter where you are. That's why you kind of want to have your mat on you um, at all times, because if not, you're going to get pretty dirty. Um, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, the yeah, wool shouldn't always use the mat. You know, you don't always have to pull out the mat. But, you know, I'm not a despot. You know, if they pull out the mat and they want to throw themselves on the mat, I'm not going to make them feel bad about it. I don't want them to get dirty. That doesn't make me feel any better. Does the mat have to be a certain mat? Um, it's a straw mat. You know, it's an etera or an eni, as it's known. Because the reason I say this, I remember one time, um, I was a Yawo and my godmother was doing a santo and, um, you know, I wasn't instructed otherwise. So I was kind of walking around with my mat everywhere. And there was a, there was a, a santera, much older santera, um, who I threw the mat in front of her and I threw myself. And uh, she made a comment saying, wow, the Yawo use the mat all the time now. And, uh, you know, a couple people chuckled and, you know, it was an embarrassing moment. Um, and I always said I'd never make anybody feel that. But um, you have some people who... You know, they, they kind of utilize these moments to, uh, you know, really feel themselves. Um, you don't want to really associate with people that, you know, have these criterias or give them that homage, you know, because the Orisha sees everything. I didn't say anything at all. I'm incapable of embarrassing my elders. But um, her guardian Orisha saw it. Oshun saw it. You know, she's on my head. So, I mean, God bless her wherever she is. I don't know. But, um, you know, these are the kind of behaviors that really cause protocol to fall apart because, if someone's having the humility of throwing themselves, whether it's on a towel, a paper towel, or a rug, um, you know, they're, they're literally bowing to you or the Odisha that's on you, which I think a lot of people lose uh, context of, of that is knowing that they're not throwing themselves to us. We are all human beings. They're throwing themselves to the energy that we've assimilated and we perpetuate here on earth. So when someone touches the floor in front of me, it's not me, it's Orumila that they're saluting, you know, via, you know, whatever connection he has to my body or Oshun has to my body. So uh, humility is really the biggest thing here. And I think protocol has suffered quite a bit because elders really don't have a lot of humility sometimes. You know, some of them have a tremendous amount of humility. You know, I know a Santera right now that throws herself to everybody and she's got like 20 years of Orisha done and she does it just to mess with people's minds. That's not taboo though? A little bit, but she doesn't care. I mean, she's so situated with Yemaya and how well things are going for her. She does it just to you know, kind of ruffle feathers and things like that. But I, I think it's a real message that, you know, at the end of the day, years don't matter as much as maturity. You know, you have people with one year of Odisha that are extremely prepared and extremely mature. And you have people with 30, 35 years that, you know, haven't aged a day from a maturity standpoint in all of those decades. So I think that's, uh, that's super key to annotate as well for all of those. You're not obligated to throw yourself to somebody that doesn't carry or exemplify the character of that energy that you're throwing yourself to. And another thing is, is if you throw yourself to somebody and they, for whatever reason, choose not to pick you up, you don't ever have the obligation of throwing yourself to them again. So, you know, that's a one-time thing. We don't have to tolerate abuse or any of those things. So that's kind of how, you know, you interact with your elders, regardless of position and whatnot. Um, a pretty scary function to, uh, to visit is a drumming, right? Or a tambol, as it's known. Or let's say somebody was initiated in Orisha. You know, they kind of converge um, on themselves. Like, for example, in Poroye's lineage, when she initiates someone into Orisha on the Dia de Medio, or the second day um, after the crowning has occurred, you know, she gives, or, you know, the godchild gives a drumming to her Oshun, being that she's the godmother, and that's the Orisha that facilitated that initiation. So... A lot of things happen on that day, and this is pretty public. That's why we're able to speak about it, because even uninitiated people can come and visit the new priest, um, you know, as a way of being recognized by the community. For example, in Nigeria, when they crown a king, the day after the crowning, they bring him out, the drums are, you know, blazing, and everybody's, you know, saluting and paying homage, and it's a moment of recognition. It's really beautiful. Um, so we uh, imitate that as well on our behalf where um you know depending on the times of the day um the curtains kind of lifted and we're able to go and salute the iawo 
um, or new initiate in the throne, right? Or the sacred throne or space where, you know, they're ultimately initiated in. So people are like, well, what do I do, right? You know, do I bring money? Do I bring this? Do I bring that? Um, you always want to bring a couple dollars. You know, we're not asking for $100 per basket because there's going to be a couple baskets here. Um, the new Odisha is going to have a basket because they need some funds to, you know, get through their process. And this is auxiliary. Um, you got to put some money to the godmothers, you know, Odisha as well. Um, and then we got to put some money to the brother drummers. I mean, they're, they're smacking the skins all night. The poor things, you know, break them off. Um, but for example, how would this process go? Let's say you're completely uninitiated and um, you're going to one of these functions. So the first thing you salute um, when you get to a house that's going through this process is you salute the new Iyawo, right? Who's manifesting that Orisha explicitly at that moment within that home. So the first thing we do is, you know, if you're uninitiated, usually you'll kneel um, and you'll get whatever sacred instrument is affiliated with that Orisha. For example, let's say Yemaya, um, you know, you get her maraca and you salute. And then, you know, forehead and kiss the mat, put the money you're going to put, usually a symbolic number. I mean, Yemaya, seven bucks. I really don't see the need for more than 21 bucks, but, you know, it depends on how much affinity you have with that person, whatever understanding, etc. But usually the symbolic number, right, if you're able to. If not, Orisha's just happy you're there. Then, um, at that point, if you are initiated, um, and, you know, have a, you know, a, a position, the Iyawo throws themselves to you now. We throw ourselves first to the Iyawo because it's not necessarily a new initiate at that point. They're manifesting that Orisha on earth. Then, you know, the action is reciprocated. There's a ceremonial embrace. All right, we're done with them. Next, um, we got to salute the Orisha that the drum is being given to, right? Well, in that recent case, it was Oshun. So you go, you do the same thing, ring the bell for Oshun or the Agogo or the ceremonial bell, and you put a little bread there as well. You know, Oshun, five bucks, any multiples of five, you know, more than 25, I don't see the need, but, you know, to each his own. Um, and then to the brother drummers. Now, this is where people really start getting anxiety. You know, people start coming out like, Baba, how do I salute the drum? Um, if you are not presented to the drum of Anya, you can still tip the brothers. You just cannot interact with the drum on a physical level or you shouldn't be perpetuating um, yourself on the drum you know towards the front usually the uninitiated people the aleos or the visitors as they're known they're more towards the back and you know the big santeros are in the front doing their thing um you know so it's it's their space you know what i'm saying it's their moment to see if somebody comes down maybe or they just want to you know do the two-step but um for example for the uninitiated you go you put a tip you know you might tip the singer directly i mean they're all going to share the money anyway um, but if you're initiated, right, you go, let's say they're playing to your guardian angel, your guardian angel, uh, Shango, while they're doing the Oro Awafala or the, uh, the salute as it's known, however you, uh, kind of term it, you do a couple steps, right? You throw yourself to the drum. Now, if somebody is throwing themselves to an Orisha and you're present while they're ringing the instrument, usually we touch the floor out of respect because there's a crown on the ground, right? So there's respect there. The person can lift themselves someone doesn't have to lift them there i mean you know because at some point there's going to be an elder that nobody's older than you know who in the world's going to lift them some of them might not want to be lifted per se so they lift themselves you know they do their you know prostration however and um then it's time to salute the drum so we always salute the middle drum first um which is ia right she's the queen she's running things and then usually the drum that's to visibly the left of or your left of ia is going to be okonkolo now, most people would get confused here, and they're like, well, why don't we salute the second largest drum second? Well, there's a couple different concepts there. Some people say that the Okonkolo manifests Shango in its purest form. So that's why, you know, we salute Okonkolo before we salute Itotele, which is usually the one to the person's right or the second largest drum. Um, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it's a lot of minutia. You know, if you decide to salute um, Itotele before Okonkolo because you're like, well, always go to the right before the left, no one can say anything either. You know what I'm saying? Um, but if you're not sworn into Anya, you really, your hands shouldn't be touching the drum. It would be for the initiated Olorisha or whatnot, um, using their forehead. Um, you know, so forehead and kiss each drum. And then at that point, you can keep dancing or you kind of fade into the background and, you know, just enjoy the drum. Um, Baba Lawos, we, we get a little bit of a pass when it comes to touching the drum because, I mean, Orumila is technically... Uh, I wouldn't say the owner of Anya, but the facilitator at this point, being that he traded it with Shango and Iro Sunche. And at that point, we just got through that process painlessly, you know. But as, as you can see, there's a lot of there's a lot of routine, there's a lot of minutia, the 
there's a lot of details that go into any of these things, you know? So I, I think it's important to put this information out there because a lot of people, you know, they have the question, but they're kind of scared to ask because the people that should be answering it in humility, you know, tend to have an extra comment that'll completely destroy somebody's confidence. So we're all about the opposite. So, you know, it was, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely stressful when I went to my first one for sure. Really? Absolutely. I mean, I was a young man, even though we're from Hialeah, I don't come from an Ifa family per se. So the first time we went to, and it was a Guido, it wasn't even as ritualized. Um, it was still pretty, you know, like, what do we do? How do we do it? And that's where you really got to, you know, lean on your elders. You don't really want to be going to these things um, without your elders until you get to a point of understanding or you have your own credentials uh, so that, you know, you just avoid, you know, gossip and commentary. Because unfortunately, that's one of the... Uh, the underdeveloped aspects of our culture socially where, you know, there's a lot of banter and things like that where, you know, people don't have better things to talk about. So they talk about things that, you know, really are unproductive. But, you know, you're going to have that in every, you know, demographic or, you know, society, whether it's Ifa, what other spirituality, what have you. Um, so this is actually a great moment to kind of go over where does the religious salutations actually start? And, you know, we'll start. There's, there's two big stories that kind of touch on, you know, as far as um, how to greet people. The, the spiritual and religious salutations in general were born in the Odu of Babao Turameji. And what happened was, is um, there was a little frustration that was going on with humanity and Mother Earth, right? So um, men were throwing themselves to the side, right? Because they were basing it off of the Orisha they had initiated into rather than the gender that they were, you know, gifted at birth. Um, so Mother Earth wasn't coming in contact with the male genitalia, and this frustrated her greatly. Um, it was actually making her less fertile energetically. From another standpoint, some women who were initiated in masculine energies were throwing themselves as if they were men rather than women to the side. So because of this, um, the energy from their menstrual cycle was transmitting itself into the earth and she was very frustrated with this because she didn't want to interact with another woman on that level. So she was starting to, you know, epidemics, you know, weather, all these, you know, freak things and they were, they, everybody went running to Orumila to see what was going on. Divination was done where Babao Turameji um, was revealed where Ifa, you know, basically made Ile Ogere or Mother Earth's um, desires known that she wanted women to throw themselves to the side so that she wouldn't come in contact with their menses in any way, shape, or form, and men to throw themselves flat so that she can come in contact with, you know, that, you know, which uh, assimilated her the best, right? Um, the same way a hoe opens a hole or a pike, right? So, you know, that is how it was identified, you know. Um, now, this is a stark contrast to the way we kind of maneuver in the Lukumi tradition, because if you look in Africa, regardless of whatever Odishas or position you have, when you throw yourself to your parents or to the Odisha or whatnot, men always throw themselves flat, right? And women always throw themselves to the side, because over there, they crown multiple Odishas. You know, every time that um, they initiate into Odisha, it is crown-like. Um, so there's really no way to distinguish that because today, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, yeah, I'm a Yemaya priest today and tomorrow I'm an Ogung priest. So I'm just throwing myself, I look like I'm breakdancing down there. You know what I'm saying? Um, where, <laughs> you know, to the side to, you know, it's looking like Kid Glide. Shout out to Ogunda Masa. And, um, you know, but from another standpoint, when you look at our function, I mean, within our spiritual house, we follow Otura Meji. Now, from a public standpoint, I mean, you know, social norms... Are, uh, are to be accepted and respected. But in reality, when we look at our culture, you know, within Lukumi, um, we have to be a little careful because we might be living in taboo. Because, for example, like me being a son of Oshun, when I was going through my Yaurahi, I would throw myself to the side. And I didn't have a complex about it. I mean, I was just following protocol, right? But when I did Ifa and I started studying this information, it had nothing to do with machismo, but I definitely don't want to be in frustration with mother earth because think about all the ramifications that could have with me i mean look at all the hurdles and obstacles we went through to have children you know and, and the biggest curse that comes from persisting in this behavior is infertility infertility so um i mean to each his own you always have to guide yourself by your elders but let's say you're crowned yamaya as a man and you decide to throw yourself face down no one can really say anything um as far as you doing anything incorrectly other than your elders, if they run their house in a more socially 
you know, antiquitous way when it comes to Lukumi practice. But the most important thing with this channel has always been putting the information um, in front of people and people kind of deducing how do they want to progress because the day after tomorrow, the Hado may have his own house, kind of like I do now or Poroye does now. And um, they have the right to, you know, function it in the way that they choose as long as they have the literature to back it up. So that, that's one um, example of where the, uh, the spiritual salutations were born. Now, that's the first half of it. But the second half, when we actually get lifted, right? Um, if you notice, we'll cross our arms and we'll open them and, um, you know, touch shoulders with each other. Well, this actually came in Otura Meji as well with Orumila's uh, interactions with the Imale tribe, right? And the Imales um, were seen as treacherous. They were seen as thieves. Um, so Rumila began to become very, you know, cautious with them because he didn't want to get robbed or stabbed because they had this thing where they would tuck the knife and um, when you would open up to them, they'd, you know, they'd, they'd stab you. So he created this method where, you know, when he would meet somebody else, he would come in closed. You know, he'd show, you know, that his hands were open, like he'd have one arm here and the other one here, which this one was to protect himself and this one was for his weapon. When they both exposed themselves to each other and realized they weren't a threat to each other, then they opened up and then they embraced. But that's the reason we cross our arms. It's a way of protecting ourselves as a reiteration of when Orumila was kind of paranoid when he would meet other practitioners of Ifa or people from the Imale, and he wanted to make sure he was able to protect himself. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a commemoration of that, right? So that's why when we lift each other, we show each other that we care about each other and we're not here to hurt each other, then we can embrace and go heart to heart, you know? Um, so that's another interesting story. You might see also the brother Babalawos um, do a gesture where they'll touch their heart, touch their head, and then kiss their fingertips. Um, you know, before we salute and things like that. Um, Does it have to be in that order? Um, I've always done it in that order. I've seen it a bunch of different orders. I've seen brothers do a bunch of different stuff. But the way it was always explained to me was when I first asked my godfather about it, he said, it's a way to let a brother know you're always in my heart, you're always in my mind, and you're always on my mouth or in my mouth, right? And what it's trying to say is, you know, I always have love for you. I always want well for you, and I always speak well of you, you know? But another thing is, is understanding that these points that we touch, whether it's our lips, whether it's our head or our heart, are the central points of life. You know, the heart is known as emi, right, or the spirituality that lives within it, the sacred breath or daughter of Olodumare. Ori, it's also a way to salute Ori as well, um, without having to do the full touch the ground aspect. And then, you know, the mouth is, you know, a way of saying, you know, I come with purity or my ashe will always be present for you because, you know, there's nothing worse than brothers talking bad about each other or any of us talking bad about each other because everything we say ultimately does manifest, right? Then, as far as salutations and things like that, um, you're going to notice with the Babalawos, the common thing is, you know, people touching the floor in front of them, you know, which ideally should be reciprocated. Um, but why do we do that? And the reason we do that is because of a couple of different reasons. Um, Orumila was the revealer of destiny or the person who helped Ori assume his position on the body, right? Above the shoulders or in the apex uh, position. So Ori said from this day forward, everyone that has a head will bow to Orumila, right? So if you notice when people touch the floor, you know, as a result, their head is bowed as well. Um, so that's where that comes from. That's in the Odu of Babayobe. But the other interesting part is, is right after Ori said that, after he was consecrated, Eshu said, all of the children of Ori and Orumila will bow to me. So if you notice when they do that, Ori's down, but who's on top is Ipako or Eshu. So Eshu's comical. He's like, I'm above everybody. I don't care about Orula, Ori, nobody. You know what I'm saying? So once again, him kind of reminding us how superior he is to us and how much we need him and how we should bow. And that's why you see a lot of people say, hey, you shouldn't kneel in front of Eshu, but on a daily basis, we bow to Eshu regardless. Our head kneels to him all the time. Um, and if we leave it in that position too long, chemically and scientifically and medically, it's shown to lead to depres depression. Wait, so, what? What do you mean? So, for example, if my head is, if you look at a, uh, a confident, happy person, what position is their head in? Their, he their head is always up. There's confidence. They're aligned. They're identifying things. They, they you know, they're smiling. They want to be seen, right? Ori is in a supreme position there. But if you look at a depressed person, where are they? Their head's in their lap. Ori is down. And who's in the superior position at that point is Eshu Ipako. 
And the reason we don't want Eshui Bako to be in a continuous state of superiority is because he is the darkness, which is what depression ironically is identified with. You know, it's it's used as a metaphor for, you know, how do I get out of this hole? You know, we talk about holes, we talk about darkness. So that's why they say when Ori is aligned, he's upright. When he is out of alignment, Eshu or the Ayewu or the negativity um, tends to distract us or overpower us. So that's why we have to keep these guys all in alignment. And that's ultimately what the salutation is a commemoration of, you know, conceptually. So Got it. Okay, okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So it speaks of that. Um, from a protocol standpoint as well, like, you know, I was always taught that when we visit another um, Olorisha or Oluo or a brother, the first thing we do when we come through the door um, is salute the Orisha that governs that house, right? Um, my godfather taught me that, you know, very initially. He was like, if you really want to, you know, make an impression and, you know, show respect and, you know, have a, have a certain air about you, you know, as soon as you say hello to the person that opens the door for you, hey, you know, can I be given the opportunity to salute, I don't know, Yemaya or Orula or whoever's kind of the apex deities there. Um, like if you're visiting, you know, an initiate of Eshu's house, like, hey, can I salute Eshu before we kind of continue with whatever we're doing. Um, and it's always served me well, you know, it's always been received really well and people really appreciate it. Um, so that's not a bad practice to have, especially if there's confidence um, with that other person, or if we're trying to build that confidence. Cause you know, you always want to have the Orishas kind of as like a filtration device within your home. You want people to, you know, be in front of them and kind of be observed. Um, so, you know, if you notice somebody doesn't want to salute your Santo or Another thing that's very important that, that's etiquette is whatever you ask for uh, from that Odisha for that person, you do it out loud. A lot of the old Santeros, they wouldn't be a fan of when people would ask for things in silent. Like, you know, because unfortunately, you know, there's aspects of our culture that are toxic and you don't know if that person is wishing negative upon you right in front of your guardian Odisha because some people are just, you know, that ridiculous. But it happens. So a good protocol is to, you know... Um, you know, speak up, you know what I'm saying? If we have nothing to hide, you know, let's, let's put it on a, let's put a, let's put a address on it. Right. Um, so that, that's always super key as well. Um, especially with the Yawos, I think it's important to kind of go over, um, the rules of the Yawaraje and kind of understanding, um, you know, why they are and why they are not. As far as the Odu y Kafung states, because the rules of the Yawaraje were identified there, um, you can see some similar concepts as well in the Odu, like Obarafung, um, where Obatala kind of adopted a very hermetic monk-like monk -like lifestyle where he wouldn't eat salt, he wouldn't drink alcohol to a certain degree, he would eat certain things, he wouldn't eat certain things. And um, all of that is reiterated in the Odu y Kafung, which is basically the rules for Obatala's life or his taboos, etc. Um, so, you know, from a protocol standpoint, um, if an Iyawo is going to go anywhere, especially within that first three months, the godparent kind of has to know, especially if they're going to another Olorisha's house, um, which I would avoid altogether. The only houses they should really be frequenting, um, their godmothers, their Yubona, godparents, their Yubonas, or possibly their, their uh, Ifa godfather's home. Um, other than that, they really don't need to be overstimulating other people's Orisha temples because they're in a very, you know, um, influential state. At, or influenceable state at that moment and we don't want to pick anything up not that we're going to necessarily pick things up but it's an overstimulation spiritually that the person does not need um, if they are going to go anywhere um, they need to make sure that they have all of their tools with them right you need to have your umbrella your plate your jar your spoon your mat another thing for all the yawos out there please don't go anywhere without your umbrella I'll never forget, and you know, I, I, you I mean an actual umbrella? Yeah, they, they have to walk around with a white umbrella. Okay. And the reason that is is because in the Odu Obaraobe, um, it speaks of when uh, Obadala had to transport himself from one place to another um, without his enemies, um, you know, seeing you know he was leaving or things like that. So um, one of the things he utilized was the umbrella because his enemies were in the sky. And it was around noontime when they would kind of, you know, try to see what he was doing and whatnot. And because he was walking under the umbrella, he was able to function. Where some people go as far within the Yawaraje that if it's noon, even with the umbrella, you shouldn't be under the sun, which is respectable as well. It's just a reiteration of the concept. But, um, you know, you want your umbrella. I'll never forget one time during the Yawaraje, I forgot my umbrella. I was walking into Sedano's 
And um, I forgot my umbrella. I'm like, yo, I'm just going to go in, come back out, five minutes, right? It was perfectly sunny outside. And I'll never forget, when I was in the checkout line, all I heard was this big boom of thunder. I said, no way. And when I went to walk out the door, there was like a hooded area and then the parking lot. It was pouring torrential rain, right? Now, I was never going to go in the rain. But um, I'll never forget, there was a Santera there waiting for a ride or something like that. And she was just looking at me. And I was just looking at her, and I went to sit down. Um, but she was trying to see if I was going to break taboo or not, and I did not. Um, but from that day forward, I never went anywhere without my umbrella because I was stuck in Sedano's for like an hour. So, you know, it's things like that that you want to avoid, right, those uncomfortable situations. But it happens to the best of us, but we just want to be prepared. Um, as far as protocol, um, when you go to other people's houses, if you're invited and you're still going through your process, have your mat, all the things you need to, you know, maintain your yawaraje. Um, make sure you're throwing yourself to people. Um, make sure we don't talk too much. The yawo really doesn't have much to say because ideally we shouldn't know as much as we think we do. And it should be a moment for study um, and, and kind of growing and kind of sucking all this knowledge we can from our elders and our home. Um, so that that's going to be super key. Um, from a protocol standpoint, from a protocol standpoint as well, the Iawo should not be overstimulating certain spaces in nature, right? So I'd, I'd rather not see a Iawo, um, I don't know, at a cemetery, at the river, at the ocean. Um, you know, ideally, I wouldn't like to see them too long in a supermarket or, you know, kind of behaving inappropriately anywhere. Um, but, you know, we have to get groceries too, so we still have to live. But um, it's all about context at that point. But it's, it's a very ritualized process and lifestyle um, that we need to be fully aware of before we take that step because if you're not prepped for it um, it's like starting a diet without little by little leading into it you're going to go through those first two weeks of shock and we don't know how you're going to react to that so that, that's super key okay interesting yeah and um another story that kind of touches on why we salute the babalawos we, we, the way we do as well, being that, you know, protocol. Well, Baba, why do we have to say boruboy wachiche every time we see you guys? Perfectly great question. So in the Odu Baba um, all of the babalawos had gone to jail. And the reason they did was because Olodumare had a question for them that they could not answer. They couldn't divine. So he said, if you're a babalaw that doesn't know how to divine, I don't need you on the street, you're in jail. So there was one Babalao who basically hadn't been called yet. Um, and his name was Baba Gundameji. And when he was summoned, he was a pretty smart guy. He said, I'm going to read myself to see what goes on here. Um, and when he read himself, his own Odu of Ogundamei came out, where he fought, told him to perform sacrifice with water, food, and clothing. And he was going to carry it with him on his journey. So he was like, okay. So halfway you know, through, he got tired, and there was a river, and he kind of sat down, um, and he was uh, starting to indulge some of his rations, and he noticed these three beautiful women in the nude, and he was kind of starstruck, he's like, okay, and they approached him, so, you know, he's trying to focus on the eyes at this point, you know what I'm saying, it's funny, Phil, because you have the Mona Lisa staring right at me here, <laughs> right, and uh, yeah, she's always watching, and um, you know, they started a conversation. It became kind of normal after a while. And they said, uh, who are you? He said, well, my name is Ogun Namei. I've been summoned to the palace of Olodumare to uh, answer a question that no one else has been able to. And they said, oh, that's cute. They said, uh, do you have any clothes that you could give us? And he said, ironically, I do. I brought a bunch of cloths like Ifa told me to. Please, you know, put some clothes on, you know. Um, and they said, well, uh, you know, we're pretty thirsty. Do you have any clean water? And he said, yeah, I do, here. Uh, we're also hungry. Could you feed us? He said, of course. Oh, geez, okay. And he fed them. Um, and they were very content, and they were spending time with him. And they said, uh, you know, we may have the answer that you look for, but we want you to promise us something if you get the question right. And he said, anything. They said, well, we want you to marry us. Ooh. And he was like, okay. And they said, we're the daughters of Olodumare. My name is Iboru. My sister's name is Iboya. And um, this one's name is Ibochiche. And Olodumari is going to ask you what our names are. That's why no one's been able to, uh, to know anything because he's kind of kept us away because he didn't want us marrying a Bawalao, you know, because you guys have a reputation. And um, he was <laughs> like, okay, well, I promise to keep my promise. And um, he went about his way and he arrived at the palace. 
And, um, you know, all he saw his brothers in jail. And my sign was in jail, too. Ireta Suga was in the pen. And um, Olo Dumare said, uh, I have a question for you. Maybe you'll be able to answer it. He said, I'll do my best. And um, he said, what are my daughter's names? And when he threw the chain, Ogunda Meji came out again. And he said, her name, the first one's name is Iboru. The second one's name is Iboya. And the third one's name is Ibochiche. And Olo Dumare looked at him and said, you really are what they say you are. All of your brothers can go free. But I want to give you a personal gift of your choosing, whatever you want. He said, the only thing I ask is that you allow me to marry your daughters if they say yes. And Olo Dumare looked at him and he said, man, you're bold. We'll see. And when he called them forward, they all said, yes, we want to be his wives. And Olo Dumare kind of realized what had happened, but he was happy regardless because he'd been trying to marry them off. And they were so close, it made sense they were going to want the same husband anyway. <laughs> and, um, you know, Ogunda Meji, to all his brothers, said as a commemoration of these women saving our lives, because if I wouldn't have figured it out, he would have executed us all. To oh. be able to commemorate us, or more importantly, these, you know, divine women who saved our lives, whenever they salute Orumila, they have to salute his wives. So that's why when you see a Baolao, you'll hear Boruboy Wachiche or. It's a, it's a phrase that, you know, I use a thousand times a day, you know, toxically, right? But um, it's a commemoration of those women, you know, saving us. So, um, you know, really beautiful story, um, regardless of what your, view, your views on polyamory are. But he was married to all of them, and he loved them, and they loved him, and they, they had a wonderful life, and had a bunch of kids. And, you know, Oguna Mei is a beautiful sign. It's all about the family and the tribe. Um, so that's why we say Iboru a thousand times. Um, but, guys... You know, protocol is important. You know, a lot of people, you know, may interpret things differently. I'm not here to radicalize Ifa. I'm not here to reform Ifa. That's not the goal of our channel. Our, our goal is to put out information that is going to aid people that they may not have had access to up until this point because it's been so shrouded and at the bottom of the pile because some people haven't read enough to get to the bottom of the pile. So that's our biggest thing. However someone chooses to maneuver their spiritual house or their spiritual life is completely dependent upon them and their study. So, you know, really beautiful video, um, really beautiful patakis as well. A lot of them really aren't public knowledge like that, so I hope they serve you all well. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of really rich literature when it comes to how we're supposed to interact with each other. And, you know, this video could lead to so many other videos because there's social aspects to our interactions. You know, we never, and it really leans back. If you guys haven't had the chance, Ifa Protocol is going to reiterate a lot of themes, um, you know, conceptually from the 16 commandment video. All of the protocol is based on those laws. So you're going to see a lot of parallels there, you know. But once again, we should never speak about each other negatively. Any issues that we have with each other should be resolved in private. Um, because at the end of the day, if we insult each other, we're just insulting Orumila and uh, our spirituality. So we always have to maintain elegance. And that's a huge part of protocol. So, you know, yeah. things like that. Well, speaking of elegance, you want to know what else is pretty elegant? The music for our members. Yeah. That is right, man. <laughs> Love that segue there. Absolutely. You know, like I said in the beginning of the video, guys, directly under this video, there's a join button, which uh, takes you and gives you access to the Our Roots membership. Absolutely. Which is three separate tiers, each offering its own different perks. So on this one, we are giving some love to the people that show love to the channel. Oh, man, the best part of our so channel. So here we members. go. Yeah, absolutely. Super fans, we got Ray Valentine. Thank you, Ray. Derek Jones. Oh, Derek. We got Melissa Fraga. Thank you, Melissa. We got Dr. Nakia Brown. Oh, doctor. And the VIPs, we got oh, Iggy. The Vips, shout out to Ig. Yeah, we got Desmond Dawson. Oh, Des, what's we up? We got Luis Caminero. Thank you, sir. And we got Dominic Santiago. Dom, thank you so much. Guys, a couple closing thoughts before we go ahead and disconnect. Well, Donnie Got Candles and More.com is up and running for all your spiritual service and product needs. We ship. Um, catch the podcast audio on all of the major platforms, Spotify, Apple, etc. Um, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. A big thank you from all of us here at Our Roots Podcast. And until next time, see the light.